Welcome to the Global Journalism Seminars. This is The Briefing. This week, we delve into the world of exiled journalism, where words transcend borders and stories emerge from the shadows. From countries like Myanmar, where journalists have been exiled for exposing military atrocities, to Russia, where independent voices face repression, journalists find themselves forced to leave their homes in search of safety and freedom. Exiled journalists play a crucial role in shedding light on human rights abuses, corruption and political oppression through their resilience, exiled journalists left behind. The work is fraught with challenges, from navigating new languages and cultures to operating within the constraints of limited resources. Despite these obstacles, exiled journalists continue to stand firm, bridging borders with their words and reminding us of the power of journalism in demanding justice and preserving the truth. We asked our journalist fellows, have you ever had to report on a territory or region you cannot access? 60% said yes. We're joined by researcher Louisa Esther Mugabe, a PhD candidate at University College Cork in Ireland. She studies the phenomenon of contemporary exile through interviews with journalists exiled from East Africa and Latin America, and will talk to us about some of her findings. That's the briefing. Let's begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Global Journalism Seminars. I'm Caitlin Mercer, and you're joining us on a fairly hectic day. Not only is this the penultimate talk in our series for the year, but it's also DNR launch day. Uh, so it's really all systems go around here. Uh, but it's also a good day for us to put a spotlight on the extreme challenges being faced by journalists in 2023. We know from the DNR that journalists are facing increased criticism from governments, and that criticism in some places extends the point of journalists being forced into exile by persecution, by war, and through targeted discrediting. To discuss this today, we have several journalist fellows at this webinar who have been exiled themselves, as well as our guest, Louisa Esther Mugabo, who has been researching the phenomenon in East Africa and Latin America. Louisa is a PhD candidate at University College Cork, which is in Ireland, and she's previously worked with Burundian exiled journalists in Rwanda and uses decolonial methods and theories in her work. This is going to be a really fascinating conversation. So thanks, Louisa, for joining us today and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you to everybody who is attending the seminar um, because I believe it's a very important conversation to have. So thank you so much for this opportunity. It really is an important conversation. Um, I thought maybe we should start off with a little bit of contextualizing. Um, so what brings you to this field of research specifically? Um, what, what, what originally motivated your interest? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, as you said, I'm writing or I'm, I'm researching contemporary exile journalism from East Africa and Latin America for a PhD. Now, um, this was the result of two, a two-folded interest. One was personal. I was very lucky um, five, six years ago to, to meet some exile journalists um, from Burundi mainly while I lived in Rwanda. And um, I just was very lucky to develop a personal friendship with them and to, to learn about their challenges and to realize that there is actually um, extremely little that I know, but also extremely little that the world knows and um, also very little interest, which then also results in basically a total absence of structural support for journalists like that, which was a very stark contrast for me from what I thought, because I always thought like exile journalists are always um, presented as those very um, almost hero-like personas in the public discourse. But when it comes to the real life experience of being an exile as a journalist, um, there was a dominance of being abandoned by the international community. So that was the personal mm. interest. So that just motivated me to really want to work with exile journalists. I prefer saying it, that I work with them than, than on them. Um, and then that developed into an academic interest. So I was mm. really lucky that I could write my master thesis on the Burundian journalism produced from Rwandan exile back in the time in 2020. But as I say, it was a master thesis, so it was very limited to um, 
to compare their practice to existing journalism theories and eventually I came to a um, conclusion because I had to compare it to existing theories in journalism that are, as we all know, very Western dominated, very normative, set in ideal mm. setting. Mm. Um, it, it was just not a very satisfying conclusion that I had to draw because the conclusion or theories that are out there. And I was like, yeah, but that's, that's not a satisfying conclusion because I don't want to belittle their work on the content. Mm. I want to shed a light on what's different form of journalism they do so that's how I proceeded to do a PhD then and said okay we need a new theory now that's an ambitious project but maybe I won't come up with a theory but at least with a more independent approach to really trying to create an understanding of what exile journalism is mm. yeah Please, I'm, I'm really glad there are two things that I'm really glad you said there and I want to touch on both of them but let's start with the first one um uh that that often this topic is, when it is spoken about publicly, it's spoken about in a very romanticized way. And that is a, a really big danger that um, uh, has damaging consequences. So tell us a little bit more about what you mean when you say the romanticized image and, and what are the things we need to be careful of over romanticizing when we have this conversation? So I, I think when we speak, um mostly about and not even with exile journalists it's always in the context of like press freedom defenders and um we have now seen a generally good race and awareness about exile journalism through um, the russian and, and ukrainian situation um but whenever it's then spoken about about the, the brave journalism that russian journalists for example do know from exile they it's it's always linked to the political context and it's I, I don't want to say easy but it's kind of easier for western people right now to kind of praise them because we have a very clear political stance whereas um, me for example working on Burundi or Eritrea nobody really cares nobody really knows what is happening there um so when we hear about journalists being in exile from them it's still nice because they still defend press freedom but there's no um very public stance on the situation so there's no um there's no further interest in their work but we still like to put them on a pedestal and say oh they are so brave but actually they know what they do and now the lack of awareness is, is not just extremely frustrating on a personal or emotional level it translates into like into what i have seen into basically a total absence of structural support which starts mm -hmm. at, at things such as like how do journalists actually even get into exile? Um, how they can how can they continue? How can they even get equipment? Is their media gonna get registered? Because there's no interest. And at the same time, once a year there's a press freedom event, it was like, oh yeah, I know this Burundi and we had to flee. So let's put him here and he's gonna tell us, and then everybody's gonna be shocked about the challenges that he that he's gonna speak about there, but there's no structural response. Yeah. Yeah. I'm get I'm getting all worked up. <laughs> I need to not get all worked up. <laughs> I do agree with you. Um Louisa, uh I have to ask um the second point that you raised and you slightly addressed it in this answer, but why you um then if you know I it's it is good and right that we highlight the plight of exiled Russian and Ukrainian journalists. Um, um, and it is problematic that that exiled journalists in Myanmar and Burundi and 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 across Latin America don't get the same attention. But um, why do you feel why why are you a, a white German woman the person to take on this research and and what are some of the dangers of you taking on this research? I'm I'm really glad that you're asking that because that's um it's a complicated one and one that I try to be as transparent and um self-critical as possible. Mm -hmm. So it is a fact that I'm a Western researcher and I'm researching a community or or communities in plural that I am not a member of. Um, so there is a danger of like stereotyping them or or misinterpreting um lived experience that um 
I, as a German, most likely do not experience. Exile is just something you can study as much as you want. You can study the condition of exile, but if, if you don't live through it, I, I would never claim that I understand what it is. Um, mm. Now, I, why me is... I, I think I had access. I had, I ha as I said, I, I had friendships first, and then I had trust of those people, and I realized they were just really We are being joined from the depths of the Black Forest today, so there might be some insight. Having conference um, herself. Sorry, am I back? You are back. <laughs> and the last thing we heard was that you had developed friendships, you had developed trusts, and you were in the right place, and therefore... So, so it was a question of access as well, and then also mm. trust instilled in me. Now, that comes with a huge responsibility as well, because I keep, I keep telling them, I'm just a PhD student. I, I won't change the world for you, but maybe we can change. Um, but maybe we can start creating a general understanding. And I believe that I have a lot of privileges as a as a white Western researcher, a lot of access to institutions such as Rogers Institute, um, such as um, university contexts, and and even in journalism. I, I just have those privileges that I prefer to share rather than just exploit and keep, keep to myself. Um, yeah. So so I'm trying to be as, as self-critical as I can, yeah. Mm. And that's a yeah. really encouraging answer and thank you for your transparency on that. I, um, it's, it's hard um, that we have to have that conversation, but I also think it's necessary to, to set that platform at the start of this conversation that we know that these are the challenges. If, if I can just add one, one thing real quick, also one of the privileges that we cannot forget is like, of course, exile journalists know best how to speak about their experiences. But we're going to talk about the challenges that they experience shortly. Those, cha that those challenges are so multi-layered and so yeah. complex and all encompassing and I do not have those challenges, right? Which means I have the privilege of actually having the energy to mm. invest into making people aware. Because a lot of the people that I speak to, they don't have any energy nor time left to fight on that end now as well, because they are glad yeah. if it's right. Yeah. So this is a sense of privilege that I have that I that I want to try to share. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, you've set it up perfectly. Let's talk a little bit about your research design, the main challenges that journalists highlighted to you. I know you've got some slides prepared, so um, I'm going to just kind of fade into the background for a while and let you talk about that. Thank you. I will just quickly put it on. Yeah, I think it should be up in full screen right now. Yep, you're looking good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we um we have now already um, said that there are so many challenges, and I I have put them just in. I will just put them here as a slide in the background. You can't go into all the challenges because um, exile is just a condition that changes everything and every aspect of a professional and a personal life. Um, now. From a very theoretical academic point of view or journalistic practical point of view, the, the main aspect of my research and of my interest was like, how can you actually do journalism while being an exile? Because it's one of the biggest um, um, gaps between how we understand journalism nowadays and how journalism in exile is, is produced is it's not surprisingly the access to the territory that was also in the in the short video that was there. Um, normally, journalists are expected to be eyewitnesses, to be on the ground, to verify their own information. All of this falls apart once you're in exile, right? Because I, I think, sorry, I should have clarified that in the beginning. When, when I speak about exile journalism, I speak about journalism produced by journalists that are exiled from their home territory, but still report yeah. on their home territory for audiences in the home territory. Mm -hmm. so that brings a whole lot of practical journalistic challenges, um, such as, as I just said, access to information. How do you verify information? 
Also, how can you be transparent? That's another pillar in journalism. You have to be transparent, right? A big difference also between academic and journalistic work. In, in, in academia, it's very, very normal to anonymize all of your data. In journalism, it's not because you need to gain the trust of your audience. You, you are transparent about your sources, about your work process, about yourself. In Exa, you can't do either all of that or one of those things, at least you, you will never be able to do. You have to anonymize your sources. Sometimes you have to stay anonymous yourself. And then, of course, um, objectivity, one of those very contested, very critical concepts in journalism and studies um, and in expectations towards journalists. We all have to be objective and neutral. Luckily, the conversation is moving on. Hope, um, by the Western media who are not hiring extra journalists because they say, well, but you're not objective because you're an exile, so that makes you an activist, which is actually exactly what the home government say as well. They label them as rebels or purchased or opposition. So mm. a big challenge in the public perception, but also in the personal life because um, I have a whole spectrum of answers when I ask the journalists that I work with, are you an activist or are you a journalist? There is somebody who would tell me, the moment we go into the direction of activism, we fail our profession. Mm. There's others who tell me, why are you even asking me that? The moment I go into exile, I already have an activist stance. Yes. So all of that is, um, is complicating journalistic practice. And then like base things such as just having equipment um and a physical newsroom not yeah. all journalists from the same country have go into the same other country into exile um the lack of a newsroom um structural issues are linked to that um information distribution in audiences now i just said exit journalism is targeted at the home audience but audiences change due to their very many reasons like first of all how can the home audience access the information access your exile media like if we take the case of eritrea eritrea is in blackout since 2001 there is no internet so how can you actually reach them or mm. in burundi burundians are gonna be maybe even persecuted but like definitely in danger if it's found out that they listen for example to radio in Zambo, which is on the XA radio station so how do you actually reach them internet penetration there is very low as well um and then also of course because you are in exile you start connecting with other people from your home country in the diaspora so somehow the diaspora turns into an audience as well um very complex issue there I don't think I really have to say much about safety. Safety, just because you're an exile, you're not safe. That's the mm. basic, the bottom line that I keep getting. And even if you are safe, your family back home is not safe, or the sources that you speak to are not safe. Um, I think I will skip the organizational structures and talk about that later a little bit more when when we speak about the structure. Uh, a story that stuck with me. Um. Lack of funding is just something that you can't, you can't, you just said that you, you don't want to get too worked up. Uh, well, it's the same for me. It's been since 2018. I'm just like, there's a, there is a total lack of funding. There is nobody who wants to fund exile radio stations. The ones that, that do fund exile, sorry, I said radio stations because in Africa, in East Africa, they mostly work in radio, but like exile media. There is no structural support. I, I, I keep repeating myself, but it's very important to actually let that sink in that there is no mm. structural support. Um, I already spoke about exile journalists not being really recognized. And then I, I just leave them in the background, the other struggles that are related more to like the psychological burden, the, the, the practical life struggles to actually be a migrant in the most yeah. cases, to be a refugee. Yeah. To get like to obtain like legal status and all of those things, it's, it's huge. It's all encompassing, and we cannot forget about these when we speak about the journalism that they produce. Because yes, it influences the journalism. Yeah, um, I want to ask. Um, would you would you would you stop sharing for one second? I I want to focus in. I know that you're not you're not a psychologist. This isn't a um, psychologically focused work um, but could you share a little bit about 
where you've highlighted the psychological burden, um, what journalists have told you um, about the psychological burden that, that comes with exile journalism? I, I think I can highlight it in relation to like um, how it also affects their work because this is mostly what I would ask for. Um, there's one journalist who told me they have been in We'll hold for the Wi-Fi. You're back. You know what? <laughs> I actually thought um, I'm going to skip that question. Let's move on from it because we've got people downstairs who can talk to that. Um, so let's 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 wait until we bring them in, um, and instead go to a more practical uh, angle on the story and ask you. Um, have have other solutions that you've found that are, that work for different individuals that could perhaps be applied. So the sad reality is that exile journalism is not going to go away. It's going to become more and more um, the case mm. for um, more and more journalists around the world. The the obvious solution would be to have better press freedom and, and, and protection um, globally. But of course, if we speak now about the practical aspects of journalists being in exile and the solution, mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are several things that stuck out that um, I think um, would be good for anybody who is faced with exile to know. One thing is, um, and that's not surprising for journalists and for, for the journalist fellows sitting there, to really keep your network very, very tight, like prioritize network, network, network inside the country. Um, direct contact, contacts that you have verified for years, contacts that you trust. And also when I, that, that includes a network with contacts that are independent from each other because that's eventually gonna be crucial for your safety and for the safety of, of your sources and uh, and and the verification of your information that you obtain mm -hmm. through your networks. That, that's the network inside the country. And then also, and I think this is something that's maybe a little bit more positive now because this talk is really hard. The topic is not really, there's not a lot of positive aspects. Um, I think prioritize networking amongst journalists, the international journalism community as well, because the good, the successful stories that I have seen were because or thanks to the support of the journalistic community in the Hudson country. Mm. The Burundians were able to establish exile media initially in Rwanda thanks to the support of the Rwanda Journalist Association. Um, the Nicaraguan journalists are currently in, in Costa Rican exile. They, they have huge collaborations with the Costa Rican journalist community. And then across Latin America, there's a huge support for get competition. Um, and, and I think this is very important to, to keep having in mind, not only in exile journalism, in journalism generally, we should focus yeah. more on collaboration than on competition, yeah. but we all know yeah. how journalist training is, and a lot of the journalistic field is very competitive. And, um, I think those are two things that are really big that newsrooms can start doing already now. Mm -hmm. international collaborations, local collaborations, and also establish a code of con conduct when it comes to anonymity. I mentioned that earlier in the seminar. This is something that is not well seen in journalism, to, to have anonymous sources and all of those things. We need to move forward to actually make this, to have a general practical code of how to work anonymously and and which rules to follow yeah i'm just on my phone telling the the fellows downstairs uh that i'm i'm gonna um uh call on them now as we reach this kind of 125 mark i wonder one of our fellows is joining us online um natalia from russia and i'm wondering natalia if you would mind telling us a little bit about how you're perceiving these findings how how do they ring with your personal experience and 
Um, and perhaps the, the psychological question is more for you about mm -hmm. the psychological impact. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, thank you, Louisa, uh, for your extremely important uh, work. Mm -hmm. I would like to add firstly that um, uh, among uh, challenges, it's uh, extremely important to underline the factor of motivation uh, because uh, first steps, uh, first months in exile, you feel angry, you feel uh, that you're ready to fight, but uh, mm, day by day we do our job and we see that impact of our job. We, we can't uh, destroy the regime, we can't do something very um, important, something very visible, I would say. And uh, I understand that motivation in general for journalists is a uh, uh, very hot topic all the time, but uh, when you are in exile, it is the grade of this situation, the grade of this fluctuation between when you are very highly motivated and you are going down very deeply uh, for several several months. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, the grade is uh, mu much higher. So uh, I would like to ask you, um, uh, Louisa, have you explored uh, choices made by journalists in exile? Uh, how many of them are staying in the profession? Thank you. Um, um, thank you so much for, for sharing your experience and um, asking that important question, which is extremely important. I think I should have done a disclaimer in the beginning. Um, now, I'm trying to conceptualize exile journalism as if it's the norm for journalists who have all of the challenges that we just outlined a few of them. Most of the journalists who go into exile actually are also forced to leave the profession. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons, personal reasons, practical reasons, political reasons, um, Louise, motivation. You broke up there. Can I just confirm that you were saying most journalists forced into exile are also forced to leave the profession? Yes, that's Thank yes. you. I, I do not have data this is another very big struggle by the way not only for my work but also for the general awareness of exile journalism there is no data there's spotlights um there is there is no um general survey hmm. but we know that a lot of journalists have to leave their professions once they go into exile so whatever i'm conceptualizing right now is also with the hope of once we have a better understanding, a structural understanding of the challenges, which will hopefully lead to more support. Now, I know I'm very idealistic about the impact of a PhD, but eventually, if it would get there, mm -hmm. that we can also keep more journalists in the profession. Uh, by mm -hmm. the way, this question is also very gendered from the very non-quantitative <laughs> analysis that I have. A lot of the women are forced out more of the profession than the men who have to go into oh. That's interesting. Uh, let's go to another woman then. Um, Tutu is downstairs uh, from Myanmar. Um, Tutu, how does how how does the hearing this information um, strike you and affect you? Uh, yeah. Thank you for the sharing your findings. Uh, it's really um, similar to our situation in Myanmar. So there's a like I have not been able to return to my country for two years now. Uh, there's are many journalists, like hundreds of journalists in the border area or in the jungle, and they are like um, experiencing a lot of like a struggle, a lot, a lot of problem, like uh, to be legitimate to, to stay uh, in the area legally or to stay in the area to report uh, on Myanmar uh, safely. So like safety concern, legal concern, also the mental health, like impact on the mental health also a big, big issue. And every journalist I interview, also myself, uh, experiencing the mental uh, kind of like a struggle, like having nightmare, something more. <laughs> so yeah, and also like the support uh, to the journalists who have been in exile is like really like, maybe there's, there's little, but like not enough. Like we need more like immediate support and yeah, I don't need yeah. for that. And this is this is kind of what your project here is focused on as well. Is is understanding what it is that that citizen journalists and exiled journalists need in terms of 
how to continue reporting the news. Is that a fair summary? Absolutely. So, sorry. It's sorry, actually, both of your work, but uh, carry, carry, carry on. <laughs> what were you going to say, Louisa? Uh, I, I think, I, I think, um, sorry. Oh, Wi-Fi is gone. I'll just say while we wait for the Wi-Fi to come back, that please, if you do have why questions. Why I'm doing this you'll... work. Sorry, Louisa, you broke up again. So I was just telling people to put their questions into the Q&A function if they want to ask you anything. But yeah, you, this is why you're doing this work? Yeah, um, I'm so sorry for the Wi-Fi. No, um, don't worry. It's OK. Uh, yes, because like the challenge is that we just don't frame before and that um, your fellows also thankfully shared with us. I, I think for everybody who sits down for, for three minutes and thinks about it, they are not surprising. The problem yeah. is that they are not structurally worked on. A lot of times it's just like, well, it is challenging. And that, that's it. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm trying to structurally like really break through them and say, okay, but what does that mean? And then eventually yeah. what does that mean for reporting to make it yeah. better? Yeah, enough of like spotlighting stories and violence and like, this is so sad. What are we going to do about it? Exactly. So here's a weird question. Is, is this something that newsrooms themselves should be working on? Is it a problem that, that it, are there things that newsrooms could put in place ahead of time um, before, before people are sent into exile or is that crazy? I think um, it links to the story before when you asked what, what um, practical skills and stuff people should develop if they think they might be faced um, mm. with, with exile. In, That's in probably Greece. the better question. What are the practical skills that individuals need? And and I think it links back to the networking. That's the one thing that, that's, that has to be highlighted in exile. The other practical skills, now I want to say, um, Another big frustration that I had is the, the one point that I said, the non-recognition of exile journalists, right? Because of like whatever objectivity and so on, which to me makes absolutely no sense because the journalists left their home country because they stuck to their professional values. That's the point. They refused to be corrupted. They refused to do propaganda. They were persecuted for professional journalism. And once they are in exile, that professionalism is stripped away again from them by Western media refusing to actually hire them to continue reporting on the countries that they know that. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional. Yeah, but this no, is the thing, okay. if you link that back to the professional skills, the professional skills are there. Those are professional mm. journalists. The, mm. the, the recognition is the one that is lacking. And not mm. only the recognition of them as individuals, as professional journalists, but also of the different conditions that then mm. also lead to a, a slightly different form of journalism, which does not mean that it's less less professional. So I yeah. think if we ask the question again, what can newsrooms do? I do not have practical recommendations for newsrooms that might be thinking about um, shifting into exile or relocating, being forced to shift into exile. But I have a, a request for newsrooms who are in so-called safe countries hire professional exiled journalists. What is mm. stopping you? Why are you sleeping on that huge potential of mm. having access to information to countries that are otherwise more and more and more sliding into blackout, into international mm. blackout? Nobody knows what is happening in Eritrea mm. or, or in, in Venezuela or in Nicaragua because that's the intention of, of those regimes, right? That there mm. is not nobody reporting on it. Anymore. So yeah. that's when you speak about newsrooms, I'm more like, I'm very confused at this stage still, five years in, I'm still confused. I have no yeah. answer to why nobody lets them write. Now, there is some people who, who, who would work with Exile journalists, with some media, and, and they, all, they, they all write migration stories, which are important, don't get me wrong. It's important to, to also cater to the, to the migratory community from their own country. Mm. But why are we ignoring the fact that those were professional journalists reporting on politics, reporting on human rights abuse? Why are they suddenly mm. reduced to being refugees and catering mm. to the diaspora? I don't understand it. Yeah. So there's one journalist who once told me 
but very, very early before my PhD, when I first started working with exajoys, the headline of my article was actually, in exile, we are seen as sources at most, but never mm -hmm. as journalists. And I think that summarizes my request to me and Drew. Sorry, I, sh yeah. I, I changed the question a little bit. <laughs> no, this is so good. This is so important. Please, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight it again and, and repeat it again, what you've said, because this is crucial. It's this, if you're sitting in a Western uh, a newsroom or in a, a relatively safe newsroom in a functioning democracy or in a functioning government system, um, and you're asking about uh, how to support journalists in exile, effing hire them. Um, that's there. There you go. Effing hire them, but don't effing hire them to just report uh, their sad first-person story about how hard it is to be in exile. Let them be journalists. I, uh, I'm. You're bringing to mind, and I'm not in any way, shape, or form a journalist in exile, I, but I happen to be an immigrant, so there's a level of empathy I have for the, 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 the kind of reality you face when you come into a new country and a new culture. You do hear things like, you, you don't really get it, you have to have worked for the Daily Mail, um, and, and this is... Um, kind of ridiculous. Uh, actually, if newsrooms could a little bit break out of those standards and norms and and just see what the person produces and, and see maybe it doesn't fit into your normal routine, but maybe it's actually something of value. Um, so yeah, let's uh, storm, the, storm the gates. Okay. Calm down, everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions from the Q and A here. Um, uh, this is great. Polina Stress is here from the uh, JX Fund, the European Fund for Journalism and Exile. Um, that's www.jx-fund.org. And Polina would like to ask you, um, what are good practices in XL media reaching financial sustainability? Is that something that you've looked into, Louisa? I know that's a bit more on the business side, but is it something that you've looked into with your work? I'm, I'm not looking into it um, for my academic work, but it's something that always and inevitably comes up um, because of probably the headline on my last, um, slide should have been challenges of exile journalism other than funding because that's mm. the overall big 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 problem yeah. is money um yeah. and there's very little business models that i have in the cases that i work on so so far i have mostly worked on the eritrean and the burundian case mm. um the burundian do not have a business model they all work without being paid. They do the journalism that they do. They do an XL radio station. They squeeze it in somewhere between two, one to two day jobs as, as immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, the Eritreans, they, they do have a, biz, uh, a funding model, which is not very sustainable in the sense of like, they have to keep applying for international grants. Mm. This is the one, and, and now um, they start thinking about starting to monetize um, through YouTube, through producing more things catered to maybe even a more international audience or um, to the diaspora. Now, um, the other, there, there are successful stories. Um, I have not worked in detail on them yet, but I know mm. that uh, it, it would turn into like crowdfunding and, and getting the international community or the diaspora um, support the media more, but that then also changes the content of the of the Excel media eventually, because mm. what is a fact is that you cannot, and this is the biggest challenge, you cannot have an audience finance journalism when you're in Excel. How is an yeah. audience that is not even allowed to listen to your radio or to read the newspaper you're supposed to fund it? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, no, this is a question that I don't really have a, a very satisfying answer to. I would be as well. Is there anyone in the room who wants to speak to this? Um, or, or Natalia Tutu, anyone else in the room 
who would be interested in talking to what is a sustainable business model for Excel journalism. I know I I personally don't have that answer. Um, uh, I, I would like I to personally uh, don't have that answer for media in general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how. Uh, I, I'm not a business uh, manager or I'm not a business specialist, but I can share our experience. I uh, say that um, it's good to rely on your subscribers and uh, your readers, uh, listeners, viewers. Uh, I was very skeptical. I was sure that uh, nobody would um, subscribe uh, or pay or donate something, but people are ready to, to support independent journalism. And I would say that it's good to be brave in these decisions. And um, if the result can be very unexpected in, in the good uh, terms, I mean, uh, but it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, uh, when you don't have uh, advertisement, uh, you can't reach um, some companies uh, in your home country and uh, you are not interesting for international companies. Only option is to produce uh, content for your audience and uh, uh, have something in terms of uh, support and uh, donations uh, from your audience. And this, uh, it can be sustainable. Want to respond to that? No. No, it um, was fingers crossed that it would turn sustainable. Um, yeah. And I, I think w one thing that we didn't um, tackle, I, um, I, I am working on four cases in two extremely different regions. Um, and while the challenges that I highlighted or some of them are, are very similar, and it's also reflected now in the experience shared by, by the Exile Fellows who just spoke, the challenges exile journalists face are very similar throughout the world. Mm. But by saying that, I in no way do I want to ignore the context of mm. where they are exiled from and where they are exiled now, and no. also how aware the international community is of it. So um, I, I think the cases that I now most emerged in, Burundi and Eritrea so far, there is no there is no journalistic business model even for the ones who before they had to flee right there is there is no sustainable advertising there is not not enough money from audiences to subscribe to stuff there is also not a, not any practical possibility to do so because they don't even have internet so they can't subscribe or or, or pay through patreon or something so that's where mm. context really comes in and that's why there is no general answer and mm. still there is one that you just said case Ben. If you had the answer to that question, you would solve the current media crisis. But I, yeah, the entire industry would like to hear this answer. But I think there's um, there's there's something important in what you said there that there's a temptation from the West to go, oh yeah, launch a newsletter, launch a podcast, and monetize it through Patreon and build your subscriber community. Uh, yeah, tell us more in Eritrea, please. Yeah, what uh, <laughs> um, where radio is the number one uh, form of of listening. So it's it's not just um, that we ask newsrooms to please um, hire exile journalists and listen to them and trust them, but also to those managing funds. Please, uh, when you when you grant funds to these journalists, listen to them and understand that a sustainable model might not look like what you think it looks like. It's probably not a newsletter stra strategy in Burundi. And and also, if I can jump in on that, from a um, writer continuously trying to apply for funds, already the bureaucratic hurdle is something that is extremely difficult um, mm -hmm. for for exile journalists like requirements such as like you have to be a media base for example in the MENA region well mm. you're technically not because you're an exile but you're working for that audience so you argue uh, can you apply for that brand or can't you and mm. then there's no there's no straight answer to that so, mm. so the, the condition of exile is not included in none of those things and then when we speak about bureaucratic hurdles um, the radio station in, in Paris that I worked with they are um, they have a project manager, which is fantastic. Mm. The um, newsroom in Nicaragua that I worked with, they also have somebody 
solely responsible for project management. The mm. journalists from Burundi that I work with, they are journalists. They don't have a project manager. They they are they, they are sent into into exile, and suddenly they have to do everything. Okay, and, but that's interesting. Is project management skills something that we could provide training in? For, I, I, I think on the one hand side, yes. On the other hand side, I'm like, to which extent do we do do we want to strain their responsibility yeah. further, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm like, if if you're a trained journalist. That should be enough for yeah. you to continue doing journalism. But, but yes, of course, um, if it comes to skills and being prepared, project management is the number one thing because that's what you have to do. You suddenly have to do everything. Yeah. So I want to go to Radisham from India downstairs, but before I do, he's actually got a question for you about Express, uh, which we haven't even spoken about yet. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's Express, what's the plan, and then we'll go to, to, to Radisham's question. I will just quickly share my screen. Perfect. Um, there's not much on it other than mostly our social media handle, which is important. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you all see that now? Yes. So um, we spoke about the lack of structural support. I'm really, really happy and delighted to see, um, sorry, I forgot the name, Paulina in the audience who also sent a question um, from the GAX Fund. There are some organizations now I um, did not want to um, claim that there is nobody working for XI journalists. Of course, there's the JX Fund, RSF sometimes does things as well. Um, so, so please forgive me if it came off as if nobody works in it and I'm the only person. I'm not, I'm not that right. But um, we, are, we are trying to still um, make it even more structural and more global maybe um, and together with uh, Befriended uh, with a friend of mine who is an exile journalist and media director and uh, project manager, we are launching Express uh, as an NGO. We are currently in the process of registering it. So whatever I'm going to tell you now about Express is mostly the plan and the dream, and hopefully we can work on it all together. Um, already following us on social media is a great support. Uh, so we want to become an organization that is based on two main pillars and that's coming directly from my findings because as you can imagine after a year and a half um working on a phd on it i got more and more frustrated of like eventually three reviewers are going to read it and that's it and i really want to change it i really want to use and and and, and change and and trigger practical change and and betterment of the situation for expert journalists so the number one pillar is we want to launch a magazine, Express, mm. for exile journalism by exile journalists, replying to my earlier emotional plea of international media, hire exile journalists, let them write on their countries. Well, we're not gonna, I'm not expecting that to change very quickly. Um, so we're like, why, why not us? Why can we not provide a platform where um, exile journalists can continue working as professional journalists. Um, I, I always said that I, I cannot give back a lot to exile journalists who have lost their home and a part of their identities and everything, but I can give back that little part of thing. I still see you and recognize you and respect you as a professional journalist, and I actually want to hear about your country. Um, mm. So the audience of that magazine is going to be different. It's more going to be the international audience, um, but the journalists are going to be the same. If you're also going to collaborate with um, the established external media that are there and um, republish some of the fantastic investigations that they have on their platforms, but that are maybe in in um, in, in Eritrea, and, uh, sorry, it's not in um, Tigrinya. Or, or in Spanish, and then it's not very available to, to a broader audience, so we will, we will translate it. And so that's an exile journalism magazine. Um, and then we would like to um, kind of fill that gap of the project management in a certain sense and mostly the funding um, slowly now. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the dream in five, ten years. We have the plan of becoming a more and more established platform, uh, fundraising platform, um, 
because we we don't have the burden of, of needing to survive in exile we can focus on actually working through all of those bureaucratic documents getting mm. the response distributing it down to the exiled media so that mm. is the um goal of express yes we want to practically support exiled jobs I think I, I'm not sure, Radisham, has this kind of pretty much answered oh, identity and provide an question. international magazine. Um, yes, Karen, she, she answered my question. Answered your question. Yes. I think um, I, I think it's worth saying on, on behalf of um, uh, me and the journalists in, in this room, um, if you i i hope that your magazine is a success but even if you don't if you simply provide a space for journalists to come together and learn from each other and just like tell tell their stories to each other and provide that support even if it's, it looks like this that it's an online space that is in itself such a powerful thing um and you said it yourself network 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 um yeah. so um i'm glad that you're opening this space up and I really hope it's successful. Thank you. Um, um, I can also point out that there is NEMO, the Network for Exiled Media Organization that has been recently launched, which is focused mostly okay. on the exchange amongst established exile media because um, what also always came up in the interviews that I did it's like we have to start from scratch. We don't, mm. it's our first exile. We don't know how to do those things. But mm. there might be somebody in exile from Myanmar who, who already worked through all of that. But there's yeah. no connection between them. So Nemo is working on that and Express is going to work on that as well. Um, yeah. we, and and uh, it's not it's not too competitive networks or anything. Collaboration yeah. is everything we are in. in uh, we, we will... We are in conversation with Nemo. We hope to be in conversation conversation with JX Fund, and just we need more and not less organizations and media working um, with and for exile journalists. Yeah. Mm. Um, we were going to have the question: Are there um, stories or journalists? that have stood out. We you should still have that uh, question. How how do you feel, Louisa? Is that a question you want to go to? Is that something you want to talk about um, in the context of what the conversation we've had today um, about sort of, it feels like the conversation has been more practical and proactive and not from a victim space and is going to that question kind of taking us into that romanticized victim space a bit or are the are the stories that you've thought about that stand out to you stories of of proactive triumph um that's a good question i had i had three quotes that are more on the depressing side not victimizing <laughs> <laughs> definitely not victimizing but i would say very real um mm. let's do it then we, we tell can, us I, we can we, i can see if i can frame it or if i can just quickly just outline them and then you see where where it brings us um there you go because um it, it was about like what has really like changed my perspective on exile journalism as well and maybe the, it's it's a nice way to go there now because it kind of summarizes the different points that i already made so the first one is um not only a tap on the back for doing the right work of coming up with a new theorization um but but also just highlighting the fact why it's also important to do it in academia and not only in the practical space because um, we have we have now drawn the, the, the link between those two things right like if if their their journalism is not recognized as professional journalism then they also don't get practical journalistic um, job mm. um, and I think this first one just stood out for me because of that by saying that um, it is important to think about exile journalism as independently as possible with the constraints, of course, of being, I, I have been educated in the West. And so I, of course, still have that lens, but I'm trying to really center the real life experiences. And it was nice to hear that this, this, is, this is something that 
they also want. And it was great to provide an interview space. I, I got that feedback as well, which changed my perception, which I tried to highlight also throughout the seminar. It was nice to, to get the feedback of having been able to provide a space, one, two hours in a very hectic life that is very yeah. focused on surviving and existing yeah. as a person yeah. and as a journalist to just sit down and actually have the time to reflect on things. Mm. Considerations, but just to think about exojournalism, there is no time to think about whatever discourses exist in the West about are you objective or not. Mm. Um, and the, the, I think the last uh, line of that bit is just so pregnant, where, where, where they say, um, where Alexander says, um, we are not journalists in, in, in impeccable clothes and big shiny houses uh, or buildings, media houses. We recorded programs in the toilets because that was the most soundproof room that we could find in the little space that we were. Mm. And this is not, I, I'm not trying to rom romanticize it. I don't really think it's romanticizing. This is just real life experience. Mm. Um, and then I, I will quickly jump to the third quote, which um, is Emmanuel from, from Eritrea, who, that was just an important thing that, that then um, changed my perspective in a sense of like not only focusing on the journalistic production as I was before of like norms and conventions and how do you handle your own identity struggles and things like that and how does that reflect in your work. But actually it was a, a very, very clear way of telling me we are more than journalists now and that does not only encompass if we are refugees or exiles or whatever that does also encompass are we managers are we um administrators all of those things um and i think it's important to to, to bring those things together because journalistic debate both in the practical and in the academic field is always very boxed mm. of like those are the producers those yeah. are the field reporters, yeah. those are the, the, the ones who do the administration, yeah. and in exile, every, everybody's everything. Yeah. So that was just the way of changing my understanding. And then the one which is in the center um, stands for itself, I would say, something that we really, that I really, really, really have to remember always working on it, talking about norms, talking about uh, how verification methods and um, your understanding of good journalism and professionalism and I always ask that question what is good journalism for you and well Valérie said well good journalist is a living yeah. um, and he also said that in regards to the journalists who are not in exile who did not leave the country or could not leave the country and he said, oh, we are not judging them. Even if they do government propaganda, we are not judging them because we know that if they don't do that, they are not, they, they, they will probably be killed or mm. disappeared. So um, that's important to have that very harsh, real life uh, realization behind the work um, yeah. and the evaluation of whatever journalism. My last question is actually going to be for Tutu, um, and um, and I would say Natalia too, but I don't know if we're going to have time. Tutu, if uh, people listening to this uh, webinar or watching it on LinkedIn or Twitter um, or YouTube or Facebook uh, are listening and they want to support journalists in exile, what's the one thing that's been said today that you really hope people listen to? Um, and take away with them? What's the one thing people in the international community could do to support you and your work? So uh, I'm, I'm like researching on citizen journalism in Myanmar. So one thing I can say is like uh, we journalists like who are outside of the country uh, having relied to uh, citizen journalists uh, who are not professional journalists and they take uh, enormous risks and they, they sacrifice too much uh, to provide footage and information. So what we need is like urgent, uh, maybe budget for the AI media to survive in the long term and also to sustain a free press. And also like capacity bathing to the citizen journalists who are taking risks and like emergency budget for their safety. That's what I 
want to request to the international community. Yeah. Good. Good. Louisa, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and thank you for your work and please keep doing it. And we wish you every success with the launch of Express. And I think the Wi-Fi is working. <laughs> we were just saying thank you, Louisa. <laughs> You're on mute. That was probably the worst time for the internet to, to go away, but I still heard you. <laughs> I thank everybody for, for the interest and uh, for the opportunity to, to you. Thank you so much. Good. More success to you. Bye, everyone. See you next week. Last one. <laughs> <laughs>